If I could, please, I'd like to get you into your New Testaments in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. There are eight verses there that will serve as the centerpiece of our study. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. I will be showing you the verses on the slide behind me in the New Living Translation. I've been reading the New Testament in a kind of an alternate version this year, and that's the one. And so I'll show that to you. You might like to compare what you see there with the version that you're most comfortable with. So if you're open to that text and you can compare the two. So in a moment, that will be the focal point of what we're doing, just looking at some of the things that Paul wrote in that letter. Before we do that, I want to remind you of a couple of things that we taught last week. We did something in the morning and I'll show you one of the slides from the morning and then came back and echoed that with some ideas in the evening. In the morning, we were in 1 Corinthians 15 looking at the resurrection and in the evening we were in 2 Corinthians 5. So let me just briefly make a couple of comments to restate what we talked about and it will tie, I think, into what we're doing today. Last week, we came together to remember the gospel the centerpiece of the gospel in which we stand and by which we are saved. And that gospel is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on a cross so that you can be freed from your sins. That he was buried in a tomb, giving the devil every opportunity to stop it. And then on the third day, he was raised again to newness of life, with victory over Satan, sin, and death, and he ultimately ascended into heaven. We're still celebrating that this week, just like last week and next week and every day in between. But what we really kind of got down to at the end is that there are some ramifications of this that ought to relate to your life. It's not just something Jesus did for you that you see here. He is calling you to participate in it. He wants you to actually share in his own death, burial, and resurrection, and you are invited to do that in three ways. The first way is through baptism. Baptism will always be necessary to be raised up with Christ because in baptism we actually share in the power of the death of Christ from Romans chapter 6 and other passages. Jesus has invited you to die to the sins of your past, to be buried with him in water, thankfully, not the grave, and to be raised up in a newness of life. He doesn't just want you to see what he did. He wants you to participate in what he did. And so we have done that, all who have become Christians. And in the end, we will do so again, this time in a much more literal and actual way in that unless Christ comes back during your life, in which case you will still shed your body, you will die just like he did. He died, you will die. His body was buried, your body will be buried, and he was raised to a new eternal spiritual life of victory, and so will you. And so right now, though, we're somewhere in between those two things, aren't we? We're somewhere in between participating in the power of his death, burial, and resurrection through baptism and participating in the power of his death, burial, and resurrection through actually dying and being raised again. And so there was this really interesting phrase in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul said, here's what I do in between. In between, I die daily. He is inviting you to have fellowship with what he did every day of your life. This is taught very clearly in Romans chapter 8, that every day you make the decision to die to self and live to Christ. That's an everyday decision. Every day you could get out of bed and say, Jesus died to sin, he was buried, and he was raised in glory, and I'm going to do that with my life today. I'm going to die to that which hurts him, and I'm going to live in the body in the newness of life. And so that's what we want to do. We want to learn better how to connect to him every day. Now, from there, we went into this little cycle in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and chapter 5. And what we learned is we are all anticipating the new body. I want to be raised into eternal life. I want to enjoy a new, eternal, spiritual body. I want to be in a place where there are no temptations. There is no sin. There is just glory. I want that and you want that. I believe in it because of his resurrection. And you do as well. But what do we do in the meantime? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and 5 doesn't say I die daily, but it does say I live with courage daily. I live courageously believing that I will be raised again. I can stand behind the fact that I know this life isn't all there is. And you have to know that in order to live this life well. You will never be able to die daily to the flesh if you think the flesh is what you're here to please. 
And so because I believe in the resurrection of Jesus, I live with courage and I seek. I seek to please him while I'm in the body. And this is the point I really needed you to get as we go into our short section of scripture today. In between your baptism and your resurrection into heaven, you are living in a physical, carnal, tempted, challenging body, and yet you are being called by God to please God in that body, to please God with that body. That's very challenging for people to do because the flesh is calling for us to do things that please ourselves, and yet we're supposed to use it to please Him. We are told in this text, that one day you will trade in your tent, that's your body you brought with you today, you're going to trade in your tent for a house. That house is that perfect, heavenly, eternal, amazing body. But what we learn is that in the judgment, the Lord's going to want to talk about your tent. You're not going to want to talk about your tent. You're going to say, I'm done with that. I'm done with life in the flesh. I'm done with what I want the spiritual. He's going to say, actually, here's how this has to work. I want to see how you managed in that carnal, temporary tent. I want to look at how you used it. I want to look at how you serviced it and how you provided for it. And we're going to trade that in for something better. And so we made a very simple point. How you use your body, the one you brought with you today, will determine whether or not you will receive an eternal one. He's going to want to talk about the body. And so we finished up with these ideas. We want to tell everybody about this. Hopefully we get past just trying not to sin in our body and we actually start wanting to tell the world, look, it's not all about this. And all of this this sin that we commit in our body, it doesn't do anything for us anyway. And it tends to break things. And I know that addiction is strong and I know that you, you want to live out your best life in the flesh. But actually, if we'll use this for him, greater things will come. We finished up with the fact that not everybody wants to hear that. That you have to endure the affliction of people who say, leave me alone. I want to use my body like I want to use my body. And nobody has a right over my body but me. Now, that's the way the world thinks. But as we get into today's study, I hope that's not the way you think. I really hope there's not someone here who claims to be a Christian saying, look, I'll come to church and I'll do what's right and I'll study my Bible. But don't tell me how to use my body. It is not your body. It has never been your body. That body was created by God. It was loaned to you for a very short period of time so that you can utilize it and fight for its integrity and show your love for God with it. And no, the world doesn't want to hear that. But we keep sharing this message because in the end, this is the cycle from last Sunday night. In the end, we know that no matter what it costs us to deny the flesh and stand for the truth, the weight of glory eternally that is coming is worth all of the costs. I believe that and I hope you do as well. So I really wanted to hit on that idea that, number one, he wants you to share in his death, burial, and resurrection in the way you live in your body every day. And one day, he's going to want to talk about the way you used your body to discuss what might be coming afterwards. Now, with that in mind, would you please go with me to our text for today, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to put it up in a couple of verses at a time segment on the board here. Again, the version will be different from what you're used to, but we'll use it as a guide today. Let's start very, very simply in verses 1 and 2. He says, finally here, this letter actually has a lot of interpersonal stuff between him and the church there. There's a lot of doctrinal things in the first three chapters, but mainly it's a lot of things about their relationship. And then he really builds to one of his stronger points, and he uses the word finally. Finally. Dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to live in a way that pleases God. As we have taught you, you live this way already, and we encourage you to do so even more. For you remember what we taught you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. Now, there are three simple things. I'm going to show you a couple of little lists in each text, and we'll move through. It's only eight verses, but just a few really simple things here. We just read this in 2 Corinthians on Sunday. I think everybody in the room at least, now I've got something very specific to talk to you about this morning, and it's not an easy thing to talk about, and it's not one of my favorite things to talk about, but it very much relates to the way you use your body. But it can only be valuable from the text if we can at least all agree that I need to live in a way that pleases God. That the number one priority of my life is to use my mind and my heart and my body to carry out his will and not my own. Can we at least all agree that that's the goal? 
I'll just wait for you to nod or something. Like, that's basic. It's basic, but it's also, like, not basic. You know what I mean? It's basic to say, hey, let's just try to find a way to use this for his glory. Easy to say, but there are not a whole lot of people willing to do it. And that, I believe, is why Jesus said many will be lost and few will be saved because of this little statement right here. That my actual purpose is to try to live pleasing to God because as we saw in 2 Corinthians, we will face God with our lives and we will answer for how we used it. He said not only that, but I actually want you to grow in it. Uh, this version uses the term do so even more. You may be familiar with the New American Standard version on that. It says excel still more. Pretty common language around the Lindale Church. He said, look, it's not just be pleasing to God. It's deepen the way that you please God. It's grow in the way that you please God. We're not just saying, hey, I hope I can live like this minimal life that just so happens to please God. We actually are committed to engaging and pleasing him more. In the text, it had to do with loving one another and, and the way that you treat other people and growing in your belief in God. But let's have a goal that says, I don't just want to please God in my body. I want to learn how to please God better in my body. That's called growth. And like Peter wrote at the end of his second letter, he wants us to grow in our faith and understanding because Christ is supposed to be the author of your life. He's the one who made you. You exist because Jesus decided to make you. He breathed life into you. You're still alive because Jesus sees something good in you. Everything about your body and life is by the authority. He said, look, you remember, I know it's a challenging thing to tell you to please God and grow in it. But you remember that you were taught by the authority of the Lord Jesus. This reminds me of the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 28, go into all the world and baptize them, but teach them that all authority belongs to Jesus Christ. All authority belongs to me, Jesus said, in heaven and on earth. Go teach people to be disciples of mine. I will tell you this. If you have not submitted yourself to say, Jesus, you are the author of my life. You have the right to make the rules for my life and I will curb my life to your rules. Preaching on specific topics is a complete waste of everyone's time. I mean, how good is it going to be for me to go, look, this is what God said to do, and this is what he said not to do, and this is why he said not to do it. But you're sitting there thinking, you know, I rule my life, and I get to make the rules for my life, and if Chris can convince me to change, I will. I don't need to convince you to change. I need to convince you to believe that Jesus has the right to make all of the rules for your life. And you may be like, I don't like that. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. Everybody's going to appear before Jesus and they're all going to learn the reality of it in that last day. Everybody's going to realize, oh, wait a minute. He's the one who made my life and it was supposed to be devoted to him because in the end, I'm answering to him. A lot of people don't believe it. One day, everybody's going to believe it. The difference between a saved person and a lost person is not whether or not they believe that their life should belong to Jesus. It's when they choose to believe it. If you choose to believe it today, you can live by faith and be forgiven. If you choose to wait to the judgment, the story will be very different. So this isn't really difficult. Actually, it's quite an easy read, and I kind of like the flow of the version. And that's why I used it. But those are really simple principles. Now, specifically, though, what does he want to talk about in this section? Well, let's move forward to a couple more verses. How about verses 3? four and five. I hope that everyone in the room is saying, got it. Body for the Lord. Please the Lord with my body. Try to get a little better at it. We're all imperfect. We all need his mercy. But ultimately, these are commandments authorized by Christ. What are we about to talk about? Well, this is what it is. Verses three, four, and five. God's will is for you to be holy. So stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. Now, the Bible is very clear all throughout that we want to be holy as God is holy. First Peter 1 says, let's be holy like God is holy. But I think it's important for us at least to acknowledge. I'm not saying this isn't an addiction that you're battling. 
I'm not saying that this will be easy for you in your life when we talk about sexual sin. We're not trying to paint this broad brush of just do better on it. We need God's power to do better. We need God's help. But can we at least say this? I cannot be holy if I am living in sexual sin. Can we at least say that? Nod and I'll move on. We can say that. We can say at least that, that I cannot use my body for things that are immoral or illicit. And by the way, I've been preaching like half my life. In the first 10 years, I wouldn't even use this word. I didn't want to offend the sensitivities of the younger ones in the room. I would say things like immorality and impurity and ungodly stuff. Folks, I think it's just time to say it. There's a thing called sexual sin. And your kids already know about it. And it has many different forms. And can we at least unite on the weightier matters of God that those things may be in your life, but we need to get them out of your life. You may battle them your whole life and you may constantly struggle and fall, but you must always get up again and keep fighting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the list of sexual sins? Well, I'm not here to make that for you, but I would remind you that this is about using your body. Do you see it? Let me give you a couple of thoughts here. Number one, very easy. Sexual sin is not acceptable in Christ. It is not. It is not acceptable. You can't make up for sexual sin. You can't say, well, I have this sin in my life, but I go to a great church. It doesn't work that way. I am a total disaster at this, but I'm highly successful at that. It does not work that way. It's heavily emphasized sexual sin. But the second thing that I would put right along with it is this is about understanding what we laid down as groundwork a few moments ago. You're in that tent, that tent. It's hard to live in this tent. It suffers decay and pain, and it has these desires that God placed in it, like sexual desire that has all these great avenues but can be misappropriated. But that's what it means to control your body. Sexual sin comes in many different ways. First thing I would want you to know about that is that your mind is a part of your body. Does everybody understand that statement? You go, well, my mind is not a part of my body. So I know Chris is about to tell me that fornication is sin. That's what the Bible says. And and adultery is sin. That is also what the Bible says. And and hiring a prostitute, that's all about. but, But my mind is not my body. Your mind is your body and your body is your mind. And that's why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that if you're lusting for someone in your mind, It is the same in terms of sin as using your body to engage with that person because your body and your mind are all the same vessel. And so I would make a list and say, lust that goes on in our minds. You you may fight it your whole life. Never stop fighting it because God wants you to control your body in his honor. Pornography certainly is a part of that, which is engaging now your mind and your eyes. Fornication, unlawful sexual contact outside of marriage is sin, and those who produce such things in their lives cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. Adultery, which is in marriage, two people who are married to someone else or one person is married to someone else, you must repent of those sins. Those are not sins that can live on in this life. But there are also other things, and I don't want to make you super uncomfortable. But even among, I mean, the stories are there. Even among people who go to church, there is sexual abuse in the home, inappropriate behavior and assault, sometimes parents to kids, sometimes siblings. Do you you see that if we don't stand up and say all sexual sin must be addressed and fought, you say, well, if we don't do that, it won't go too far. It will go all the way. Because servicing the sexual desires of your body for your good will not consider the benefit of someone else, and that can lead to terrifically terrible things. And so it is not acceptable, and God expects us to control our body, to live, to live in lustful passion. And we're not talking about perfection, but we are talking about direction. We're also talking about a passion for purity that is stronger than our passion for sin. To live in lustful passion is not to know the great Lord. Turn a few pages to the right to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, please. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're told about Jesus coming back, which feels like material I'm allowed to cover here because that's what we've been talking about for the last week. That Jesus will come back and we will present our bodies to him. And we're hoping that he says, hey, you know what? You were kind of a mess, but I saw the fight in you and I saw that you understood what mattered. And I'm going to trade in that body for a better one. But it's not going to go that way for everyone. 
In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction, verse 6, those who afflicted you, and give relief to those who are afflicted and to us as well. This is 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 7, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution. Now notice this, and then look at the verse above again. Dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that first one's kind of confusing, those who do not know God. And we think about people in countries that have never heard of Jesus or never heard of the Bible. And, and God will deal with all those people, but I don't think that's what he's talking about here. The second phrase is very easy. There are people who go, here's what God commanded. I'm not doing what God commanded. But he said he'll also deal out retribution to those who do not know God. And that really troubles us. Like, God's just going to send people to hell who've never heard of him. But I don't think it's talking about that. I think it's talking about this, same author. Again, he said, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. There was a world of people there who did not pursue a relationship with God and who did not seek to know God. And as a result of that, they let their passions run wild. We cannot be like people who do not know God. In our case, the only way we wouldn't know God would be on purpose. Choosing not to know God better because you know that you would have to change things about your life. Go back to our text. Simple ideas, nothing complicated today. Simple concepts. Sexual sin is not acceptable in Christ. Keep fighting. God expects you to control your body, and he's going to want to talk about a trade eventually. And to live in lustful passion is the same as not knowing the great Lord. And again, the reason I worded it that way is we just have to get away from this idea that says, I know the Lord, and the Lord knows me, and I love the Lord, and the Lord loves me, and I go to a great church, and I read my Bible every day, and I pray over every meal. And the fact that sexually I have no control over myself is not going to hurt my eternity. He said, read it again. This is a weightier matter. We talk about weightier matters. Okay, so look at verses 6 and following. Verses 6 through 8, our last three verses. Never harm or cheat a fellow believer in this matter by violating his wife. For the Lord avenges all such sins, as we have solemnly warned you before. God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now, I need to finish with some positives here. In other words, how do we do better and how do we get this right? But we need to understand a couple of other things here. So let's make a brief list. Never harm or cheat a fellow believer. Sexual sin, very often, I almost put always, but I don't want to use a statement that, you know, has to deal with everyone's story. But history teaches us in our own families, probably some of you could say in your own families, in churches where you've worshipped, not to mention what happens in the world, sexual sin very often hurts other people. Sexual sin hurts your parents. Hurts your kids. Sometimes directly by really terrible behavior, sometimes indirectly by divorce and devastation and different things. Sexual sin hurts your spouse. Some don't realize and we need to recognize that sexual sin actually hurts the person that you're active with if it's unlawful because of what it means about their relationship with God. At some point, and this is really difficult, but at some point, as you'll see in a moment, the key to better controlling my body is understanding that the way I use my body has a direct effect on other people. That there's no vacuum where it's like, I can view this on this computer screen and it's not gonna affect anybody else. Can I tell you, you got an hour to hear some stories? that I can engage in this person because we're going to get married one day and all this, and, it's not, and nothing bad is going to, it's all fine. Like, there are so many stories of trying to isolate the way I use my body from everybody else around me, but sexual sin very often hurts other people, and we need to recognize more than just ourselves. God has called us to live holy lives, not impure lives. You know why God has called you to do that? I think there's three reasons why God has called you to do that. Joy, right? Jesus, others, and yourself. God has called you to use your body for his glory because it honors Jesus when you do that. It honors Jesus' death when you do that. It unites you in fellowship with Jesus' death that he sacrificed his body and now you're going to sacrifice something about yours for his glory. Number two, it helps other people. 
Your holy decision, the cuts that you make in your life, the plucking out of the eye, the cutting off of the hand, I know it hurt, but it benefited the people in your life. And we have to be thinking about them. And then, of course, it helps yourself, your own future, determined by the way you choose to use your body. Would you go with me to 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 6, third and final point here. Therefore, anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God who gives his Holy Spirit to you. If you guys think we can lean on human teaching to help raise our kids morally, you're insane. That's gone. That is over with. Any idea that our local school system or our local government or just the moral code of America is going to keep our kids pretty close to doing what's right and keep our adults pretty much in line is completely out the window. Human teaching is do whatever you want as long as it does not directly and violently hurt another person. And even then, even then, I don't think you can count on that a generation from now. I'm not trying to do what's right because it fits our culture or human teaching, but because of the Lord. Will you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says some things that we know pretty well in verse 9. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. And that goes into the the binary, the sex change, all the stuff that's going on, effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous drunkards, revilers, swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. He said, such were some of you. This isn't about being the kind of person who never falls into these things. That's who you were, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. Now let's just get down to verses 18, 19, and 20. This whole text is actually about your body, which makes it a very interesting read parallel to what we're doing. This actually is about the way you use your body. Body is mentioned seven or eight times in this text, and it's always referring to that thing you brought with you today. So that thing's really important. But let's pick up in verse 18. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body. But the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Now, I'm just going to read that again, maybe even slower, but I think it's so great. It starts to get to, okay, got it, Chris. Don't need you. Stop yelling. It's bad. We need to fix it. How do we fix it? This is the beginning of that part. We need to recognize that God has placed his holy, beautiful, powerful, down payment, divine spirit in us. It seems in this text that he has placed his holy spirit in your actual physical body. You know, like your soul is in your body, which is also hard to explain. The Holy Spirit is in you as well. Read it again. Flee immorality. Don't use your body for defiling things. Do you not know that your body is a temple, verse 19, a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been, well, created in the beginning, but also repurchased with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. I cannot fully explain the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's a popular question. Literal, figurative, actual, what does it mean? But at the very least, it's really powerful imagery. If you had a vessel, I don't know what the vessel looks like. Maybe the vessel isn't very impressive. Maybe it's fragile. Maybe it's easily damaged by the elements. But somehow, someway, God sent an angel to give you this vessel and said, I am putting my holy heavenly spirit in this vessel. This vessel contains the most precious, amazing, beautiful, sacred, holy thing in the entire universe. And I just want you to carry this vessel and to take care of it. You look at the vessel and say, I don't know that I would take care of the vessel, but what's in it all of a sudden would change everything. Where would you take that vessel? If you really believe that like the essence of God was in it, and everywhere, it's almost like the Ark of the Covenant. Everywhere you took the vessel, the power of God was in the room, literally in the room. The power to, to heal and help and strengthen. Where would you take it? Would you throw it in the dirt? Would you break it openly? Would you submit it to defilement? No. God is in this vessel. And I am taking God with me. Folks, if you brought a mirror, now's the moment to take a peek. 
because you are that vessel. Isn't that awesome? That's kind of awesome when you think about it. You're that vessel. The Holy Spirit of God, divine and beautiful, is in you. And you carry him around with all of his power and glory. And God made you and then bought you back so that you could carry it out. It turns out that understanding our purpose is a really big deal in living the right kind of life. If you don't know what your purpose is, then you'll get confused. You'll fall to the halt principle, hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. And who knows what you'll do next when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. But if you understand your purpose, I know why God made me. I know why God remade me. Then everything can change. So let me give you a couple of final things here. Last slide. Just a couple of final things from 1 Thessalonians 4. Just a few thoughts. These are just based on kind of what we saw. I need to accept that Christ has the right to make the rules for my, I want to say life, but I'm going to clarify. God has the right to decide what I do with my body. That's faith 101. God gets to choose and tell me what to do with my body. And what he has told me to do is to the best of my ability with his daily mercies, you fall down, you get back up, never give up on living a morally pure life. And that's not really complicated on what those things are. Because I want to honor the will of God, not just with my singing on Sunday. I want to honor the will of God with my body every day as I die daily. And I want to have the right kind of respect for the Holy Spirit who is in me. So the question is, go back to 1 Thessalonians 4. The question is, how? How can I get there? There are people in the room right now going, how do you get there from here? Part of it is grace, the faith, the life. We've got to go back and find out more about the beauty of what God has done for us and let it change us. But here's some practical things as well. We said it a moment ago this way, and we'll finish with it again. Stay in the text for our last bit. Accept the purpose for your life in the body. What is the purpose? Why am I here? Why do I have this body? What am I supposed to be doing with it? Well, number one is God wants you to use your body to love your Christian family. In fact, very directly in verse six, it talked about probably a man who is in a relationship with a brother in Christ's wife. We saw that a little bit in 1 Corinthians 5 and some different cases. But here's a guy who's saying it's not about that guy. It's not about that guy. This isn't this about me loving this woman. It's not about that guy. And God is saying it is entirely about that guy because you're supposed to be using your body, your life, your mind, your words, your hands. You're supposed to be using your body to love one another. And yet you're actually using the desires of your body to hurt and defraud a brother. He picks up on it in verse nine. It's interesting that he comes right out of sexual purity and goes straight into verse 9. Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it towards all the brethren who are in Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to... I had to get back to New American Standard so I could officially say this. Excel still more. We want you to grow in your love for one another. Instead of, and I hope we can grow through this, instead of going, man, I need to be careful not to use my body to hurt the brethren through sexual sin, wouldn't it be awesome to grow to a point where you're now thinking about how do I use my body to service the needs of the brethren. Those two things are connected. When we start to separate them, everything goes wrong. And that's what young people do when they're growing. They don't, they're like, mom and dad, this isn't about you. And mom and dad are like, you're our family. It's totally about all of us. And young people don't get it. They go, well, now this is about me and my life, what I'm trying to do, and the parents can't get them to see. Well, sometimes adults are just kids that look a little older. You're just a little grayer. But we still have this idea that it doesn't, this isn't about the church. This isn't about our eldership. This isn't about my Christian family. This is just about me and my desire for this person or my addiction to this thing. And we're just kids that are taller. We have to grow up. And part of growing up is understanding that whether it's sexual purity or commitment to a church home, your decisions matter and you affect us. And one other thing on this that's really cool is this interesting quality called accountability. I think it is important for people to be accountable to other people. To know that I'm not just trying to do what's right to help this body, but I am also accountable to this body for my behavior. And then we get the support that we need. Verses 11 and 12. We're trying to influence the world to love Jesus. Remember the cycle I showed you earlier? We're trying to say, hey, I I want the new body, and so I'm going to use my body to please the Lord. But more than just use my body to please the Lord, I actually want the world to know about this, and I want them to come as well. And verse 11. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Attend to your own business. Attend to your own business. Keep that in mind with relation to the topic we just covered in verses 1 through 8. Not someone else's business. Not someone who don't belong to you. 
not someone you have no right to. Mind your own business. But he's really talk, talking more generically. Just lead a quiet life. Attend to your own business. Work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. Why did he tell you to live a nice, quiet, wholesome, godly life? Because of your impact on outsiders. We just have to get past that time when churches, local churches and communities are known for some scandal. They're known for some way that, that people behave, for the way some family behave. We've got to be more careful understanding that the world is watching us. And largely they're looking for reasons to discredit Christ. And it's totally unfair to Christ that they're going to study your life to figure out whether they're going to follow Jesus or not. That's really unfair to the Lord that that's the way it works. But it is the way it works. People are going to study your life. They're going to look at your life. And we've learned in many passages so far this year that we're trying to be lights to draw people to Christ that we're trying to tell everybody and persuade men to love Christ because it changes your life. It changes your life. And ultimately, we're trying to get people out of 2 Timothy 2. We're trying to get people out of the grips of Satan. Being in the grips of Satan is not a great strategy to get people out of the grips of Satan. We want to show people the freedom that we have. And then lastly, verses 13 through 18. It's so fitting here since we've talked so much about the resurrection. We want to give hope to those that we love. When I finally end, th this life ends and I leave my family behind, I want them to think, you know, God's in control. God will decide his eternity. But, but he gave us a lot of hope because of the, the choices that he made in his life. He gave us a lot of hope because of the sacrifices he made. I know Chris's problems and he had so many of them, but he just wouldn't quit fighting them. And he, and he started to slay those giants. And I just want to give them that hope. It's worth the fight. In other words, I know it's hard. But for the sake of the people you love, it's worth the fight. We do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So I'm not, I'm not devastated when a Christian dies because I know what's coming. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. We believe this. He'll descend with a shout. With the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we shall always be with the Lord and we'll always be together too. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. When you pass from this life, your life is intended to be a comfort to those you leave behind. A comfort because of your faith, because of God's power in your life because of the way you use your body. But the world doesn't. Your family can only go by how you use your body. That's what everybody can see. Whether you worship or not, whether you're pure or not, that's the way we figure it out. And I hope that when this body's done and my family looks at the way that I used it and they have a merciful heart and they're going to need it, they will have comfort in eternity. But do you see the challenge? You see it? Look at the three things. How am I going to get better control over my body? You see the challenge? That's the challenge. That's the number one challenge. You see the three things that are supposed to help? None of them are about you. Instead, they're about you impacting other people. They're about taking responsibility for your life and your words and your thoughts and your actions. My life and body, they're not just about me. They're also about others. That's hard. But can I just say this? Jesus didn't like hide that from you, did he? Jesus didn't say, you know, you've been a Christian 10 years now. Maybe we need to talk about self-denial. Jesus told us in the opening parts of his ministry, he said, number one, you're going to have to repent of your sins. That's you're a sinner. You're just going to have to repent of it and turn from it. And then he said, look, I'll be very clear with you about how discipleship works. If you're going to follow me, you must do what? Deny yourself. It's not about me anymore. I'm a part of something bigger and I take responsibility for the fact that I affect my fellow believers. And take up your cross. In other words, sometimes it's going to be really hard. Really hard. Like lifetime battle hard. And follow Jesus. And remember, that's the objective. The objective is I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow him in death unto life. If you have not yet chosen to follow him through baptism, do so. So that your sins can be forgiven. One day, you're going to want to follow him through your actual death. 
right into eternity just like him. How do we prepare for that? With our bodies, with our choices, with our lives. We die every day, just like he did for us. Die to self and live for Christ. If we can help you in this way, in controlling your life, in asking for forgiveness, and receiving the support of people who love you, come at this exact moment as we stand and sing.